I'm Mark Dresner, and this is DDP TV, bringing you the latest perspectives from experts and leaders in the drug delivery and development space. DDP TV is brought to you by the Drug Delivery Partnerships Conference, the most authoritative and prominent event in the industry for specialists in drug delivery and people that are interested in the future of our technology. Joining us today is Mark Koska. He is uh, particularly notable as the inventor of the K1 syringe and founder of the SafePoint Trust, which is a charity devoted to educating the public about the dangers of reusing needles. Mark, welcome to DDPTV. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and I want to, to start out real briefly. If you could tell us about the circumstances behind the invention itself, why you got involved with, uh, what led you to develop the K1 syringe, and, and how does it work? Um, I was uh, living, uh, bumming around. I was living in the Caribbean, happened to be. I'm English, but I started traveling, so I traveled around Europe a little bit and was living in the Caribbean when I read a newspaper article which predicted that uh, one day um, syringes would be a major cause of the spread of viruses like HIV. Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating because all my, all my sort of thinking life, <laughs> um, I had always been on the search for something that I could jump into, a subject like this, where it would involve being creating an intervention to a major problem. Mm -hmm. And um, it just fit the bill um, perfectly. So uh, from that second I read that article I was in, and what I found, and, and the way that it works, is, is deliberately not exactly what I would have chosen to design, but it's what the market definitely needed to have designed for it, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and what I had done was spent three years, the first three years, not thinking or, or looking at solutions. I spent the first three years just looking at the problem and trying to understand how um, you know, these syringes are used in the field. So I looked at all aspects from immunization camps in Africa to drug abusers in Liverpool, for example, mm -hmm. um, and hospitals and nurses in between, obviously. Um, and all the way through to how do manufacturers cope? You know, does a developing world manufacturer have, um, would they need a different design criteria to uh, a first world manufacturer mm -hmm. who has more automated machinery? And in the end, I came up with what you might describe as the lowest hanging fruit. I designed something which was a very, very simple change mm -hmm. to the to the uh, current standard um, state of the syringe. art yeah. mold. Mm -hmm. And then that that mold, once converted, would then allow the locking mechanism to work inside inside the product. So essentially, it's not reusable. This yeah. it, it breaks. Right. It when does. You, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it locks and breaks after one use. But we're really proud of the fact that we can make these on existing machinery with a very small modification, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and they're made for the same price because they they're using the same cycle times for for manufacture. They use the same plastics, etc. Same packaging, sterilization. Everything remains the same. And there's literally only opportunistic training when we introduce it into the field. So we say, hey, this is a a step up, you know, this is an auto disabled syringe, so we're really pleased that you're using it. And the nurse, in getting to know that term, will then maybe destroy one um, and then go, ah, so that's how it works, and then they realize. And so essentially, you developed a very simple, elegant solution to a devastating problem uh, of, of global proportions. Yeah. Without, well, if I can just for our audience's yeah, sure. benefit, without being part of the medical establishment, without being uh, an MD or a part of the medical device or pharmaceutical industry, um, why you and not the word the the World Health Organization or mm. you know uh, some comparable entity? Um, we have a, a, an individual who one day just stepped up, recognized a problem. How did this? I, I think just to, go, just to go back half a step, 
Yeah. Um, the reason that, you know, there, it was a very simple solution to a very complex problem, but the problem still exists. It wasn't solved by just a product. Mm -hmm. um, and so it needed more than a safer syringe or a better syringe or an auto disable syringe. The, the solutions that I'm working on now involve four or five other areas. So we're, we're putting pressure on ministers of health, not just to adopt the product, but also to adopt the whole system of waste disposal and education and, and, and uh, logistics to make sure that all those products, uh, all those elements are supplied at the same time as mm -hmm. the safety product. Um, so then on to why me? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always been pretty focused, pretty single-minded. And um, once I got hold of it, I was never going to let I it guess, go. I guess not why, but how. And, and also on top of that, um, manufacturing. So it, it seems like a relatively easy hurdle. You alluded to it. How did you make this happen? How did you make this? There are obviously, um, and, and I, I hope you'll expound on this for us, there is an economy around reusable syringes. In fact, uh, having watched you speak before, I know that you've even mentioned that in some cases a recycled sells for dirty more. needle yeah. sells for yeah. more, yeah. which is astonishing to me. Mm. So how did, how did you make this happen? What was the process? Well, I think, you know, one of the key things for me has always been to try and find people who think the same or who actually feel the same. Mm -hmm. um, thinking is is pretty easy to do, but the feeling and that uh, comes out as an action point for people um, is how I've built the team. So I've kissed a lot of frogs mm -hmm. to, uh, to build that team up. So whether it was financing the idea or finding support in the World Health Organization, which eventually I did, mm -hmm. um, or what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's always been in, in uh, trying to find the right people who, who are annoyed, who are frustrated, who won't accept the inequity that a little kid in a developing world country right now is being murdered because a doctor's too lazy to walk to the storeroom and get a clean syringe. That mm -hmm. I find completely unacceptable. And I think also, Mark, it's, it's once mm -hmm. you've got that data, that three-year process of looking at the problem, it became so me that it, that became my fuel, mm -hmm. my, my passion, if you like. I because I, I realized that if I walked away, let's say I sold out and the, the company who bought me didn't do a good job. I right. would feel that I'd, I'd let all those people down. So uh, that knowledge became, you know, a burden and a power source. Tell us, tell us just in brief what the problem is. Um, you know, how, how it even started. I mean, we're talking about recycled syringes, some that are selling more than a, a cheaper, safer product yeah. in the first place. How did, how, what, what, is, what dynamic is going on there? And can you kind of elaborate on the supply demand seesaw that you sort of touched on? Um, I mean, it's been it's now been very well researched by people like Jacques Pepin uh, that um, you know that that the the delivery of healthcare in the developing world is mm -hmm. very stressed. It's very strained. Sure. So um, back in the 1960s and 70s, when that help was arriving into say African countries where there was a, a, a small um, cohort of HIV carriers where mm -hmm. they were transmitting in a very small group of with sexual transmission mm -hmm. the the introduction of, of healthcare programs which really got going in the in the 60s and 70s and the reuse of equipment without without any knowledge that that might be a, a, a transmission vector mm -hmm. caused a, a much wider base and of course now sex is um, and so it seesaws between unsafe medical care and sex. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really the unsafe medical care that, that blew the HIV thing, um, the HIV numbers into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was an unawareness that, that what they were doing was wrong. There's some very eminent um, uh, you know, epidemiologists and doctors and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, public health 
um, grand, grandiose officials as, who are still in office now were part of that problem and, mm -hmm. and were perpetuating um, the transmission routes. Of course, they're much wiser now and they understand how that is a, a very virulent vector. But what happens today is that because because not all the layers are tied together, so a mother arriving, which I've seen, one example that I've seen for myself, yes. a mum arrives, is given a choice, clean syringe for 100 shillings in East Africa, mm -hmm. or pick one out of the box. She'll pick one out of the box. So it's her um, non-information, un uneducated or non-awareness. It's, it's, it happens, whether it's legal or not, I don't know. But th that mum will choose for mm -hmm. her baby a, a pre-used syringe, a dirty syringe. To, to us, to our, our eyes, it looks like she's trying to save 100 shillings, about right. 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And yet afterwards, when we were standing around, we filmed this interaction. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, when we were standing around, the lady left with her, her baby on her hip and walked over to a stand and bought a Coca-Cola for 500 shillings. Amazing. So she had the money, yeah. but she didn't have the awareness that maybe what the doctor was offering her could be lethal to her baby. So I, that really does tell the story, and that unawareness permeates all the way up to whether it's uh, government officials or, you know, I mean, there's a, a huge hole in the, in the big NGOs and the big funders such as, uh -huh. you know, to name a few, USAID or DFID or CEDA or, yes. or even the Global Fund, where for immunizations they will um, supply adequate numbers of auto-disabled syringes, but for, for general health care programs, which they support with billions of dollars every year, they don't insist that safe injections are be, uh, is the delivery route. And so, you know, let's say you or I were we're giving $50 million to a country that didn't have an AD, an auto-disabled policy or a safety policy, um, and that $50 million was partly injectable. Next, the next year, there's going to be a burden, which we have to supply, so we now need to give them $60 million mm -hmm. because we've, we've caused $10 million worth of, of, uh, of infection. So it's just an unawareness at all levels, and I think my role now is really to tie all those levels together with the same story, which is what I'm doing through Lifesaver, through my charities. Right, and that education component is obviously critically important. Yeah. How much progress are you making on that front? And how much progress are you making in terms of there are what I'll call micro-industries, little children in streets, mm. you know, picking up syringes. Uh, people, I, 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 I've watched a lot of, of footage that you've that you've taken, you know, um, people infecting themselves, uh, burning their the blood off yeah, of, you know, crazy. well, they're yeah, yeah, ab and from a Western, you know, having grown up in a Western medical world, it, it mm. seems like insanity. Mm. So, um, have you? How much progress have you made on that education front, and also in mitigating those sort of microeconomic factors that seem to be so? First of driving? all, um, first of all, we. We at SafePoint have tried a couple of different approaches, mm -hmm. and they've both had value. But what we've now focused on and realized is that you have to tie the whole um, supply chain together. So you have to get, for example, a, an East African country, if they're being funded by, let's say, USAID, we have mm -hmm. to get USAID saying, here's the money, but here's our policy that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And that policy means that, you know, in the same way that Nike don't make trainers anymore with child labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right. um, the, 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 the funding agencies need to um, set out policies which says they have to be auto-disabled syringes, they have to be safely disposed of, they then have to be um, de destroyed within the regulations of that country, either burnt or buried or whatever it happens to mm -hmm. be. Um, and that's not happening. So the funding mechanism, which is the top layer, has to go in line. And it's with not. It's not. Mm -hmm. they, they, apart from immunization, 95%, which is curative, the, the immunization is about 5%, the curative sector is completely unregulated in terms of the finance that's put through in, in, into these countries. So that's, say, the top layer. And then you've got the ministry layer, where we've got to make champions out of ministers who break 
break the norm, who step out and say, actually, this is wrong and I'm going to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And of course, that their enemies, they have enemies because there's a lot of distributors bringing in cheaper, normal, standard syringes, right. which are going to be saying, hey, minister, you know, I was looking after you. Don't do not do that. We'll never play golf again, mm-hmm. type thing. Right. So, of course, you're upsetting a status quo, a well-oiled machine. And syringes are the tip of the iceberg. They, they are the, the lead product for many other medical disposables that come behind them with much higher margins. So that's the next layer down. Then you've got the regulatory authority, the authority in in the country. Then you've and got. And we're talking the, about generally under or undeveloped, you know, sort of third world emerging markets. My, focus, right? my yeah. focus is on the you know the, the hundred or so lowest. So uh, that regulatory layer. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, no, yeah, the the regulatory. Uh, for example, in Tanzania, there's a TFDA, a Tanzanian Food and Drug Administration, and they need mm-hmm. to say the only syringes imported into the country have to uh, have to comply with the WHO standard. Blah 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 blah. And that way, we can all work to a, 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 a uniformity, and we can all, you know, we then then we've got economies of scale. Of then scale. We, then we yeah. can roll out the right education and the same education to everyone. So then you've got your regulatory authority. Then you've got your healthcare trainers, the colleges and the teaching institutions in these mm-hmm. countries. Then you've got the healthcare workers themselves, and then the patients. Who then them, themselves? Many of these healthcare workers are not. Educated in a conventional sense, in, in our norms. Do you, do you know it's really weird that uh, I see um, I see nurses reusing syringes, but the delivery of the injections perfect. They aspirate, they do all the, mm-hmm. they they have perfect technique, and yet it goes back on the it's train, picked sterilized. up again, and put back into right. the next patient. Uh, whether they're HIV or whatever the the patient is, doesn't seem to ring a warning bell with the healthcare worker that oh yeah now this is and t- to themselves their own protection as well as you know, the the protection to the patients. So those are the six layers, and that's really now where um, last year, the last six months, have been very important for me, realizing that it isn't a one-hit wonder. It's very much this um, integration of all these layers and getting the same message and will it drill down. So Tanzania, actually, is where we've been focusing a pilot. And, for example, we've got um, a text message system that we're launching called uh, Life Text mm-hmm. to the patients. So all the healthcare, all the uh, mobile phone companies in uh, Tanzania have signed up to this on a free of charge basis, no cost to to us. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a number, a, a text short code, which the patient reads off the nurse's uh, badge. And send because the nurse asks, please send me a, a, I'll say, Mark, I've given you a safe injection. You Mm -hmm. saw that's what's written on the poster. That's what I gave you. So it came out of a a sealed packet, was used once, destroyed, and then put in a a safety box. Do you agree? Yes. Now, I was looking after you. Please send me a vote. Now, why do I need a vote? I'll tell you Mm -hmm. in a minute. What you do is you send a 10-number text. It's free of charge to you. You don't get billed for it. That goes up to the cloud. In the ministry, up comes one flag for me. I get 500 votes, and then I get upgraded to being a gold angel. So when I've delivered 500, and of course, the natural competition between, let's say, the people in this room, if we're all working in a health clinic and I'm the first one to go gold, you're like, hey, what is, you know. Right, So naturally. You know, there's a little bit of competition. And you might have a free draw for the, you know, all the golds get put in and win a scooter or something. So, um Anyway, and and that is a motivation for the healthcare workers to just do that little bit extra to comply with safety. And for the patient, when they send the text, they get a return text saying, thank you very much, remember next time, and in their local language, out of a packet, use it once, destroy Mm -hmm. it. And then that way they can show it to, hey, brother, you're going for an injection? Do this, you know, read this message and just make sure. And then life saver becomes the preeminent system throughout the developing world. It's open sourced, it's no there's no charge. You know, I might get the credit for it or brownie points, but apart from that, um, there, there's no burden on anyone using this. How system. much coverage in the developing world in terms of progress would you say you've made at this point? Oh minimal. With yeah. with Lifesaver, with uh-huh. this new system, yes. it's literally yes. in the last six months. Okay. Uh, we've piloted it in Tanzania and it's working and we'll we'll have the whole of Tanzania in 
2012. And I hope the other four East African countries completely signed up to Lifesaver. And then we're going to use them as an example. And a couple of really big people are watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to use these yes. countries as an example for a, a, a global rollout. One last kind of um, prickly question for our audience, perhaps, and for you. And that is um, most of the world's potential healthcare market is in un or underdeveloped populations and regions. Mm. What incentive, without sounding like a, crash, uh, a crass commercialist, what incentive is there for a medical device company, for a pharmaceutical company, for someone who is in business to make a living to go into these places uh, under the circumstances that you've just outlined? You mean for Is me it, or for the big for the big boys? For and it doesn't have to be a big company. It could be a small, medium company. You know what? A, a company well, in this I space do. that that isn't because these places aren't getting the they haven't historically gotten the attention they need because they're not viable markets. Now we're talking about somebody. You've just given me an example of someone who will pay a certain amount mm. for a can of Coca-Cola but not for a syringe. Mm. So is there an incentive here? Is there something that we're missing in the westernized medical industry? Well, I, again, I think it comes back to tying up both ends of, of, of or uh, both sides of the coin, if you like. Mm -hmm. First of all, that lady who bought a soft drink for five times the price of a, of a syringe, which is about the average price around the world for, you know, a can of Coke is 10 times the price of, a, uh, of one syringe. Yeah. Um, the, it, it's, it just comes down to an awareness of, mm -hmm. of what danger they might be in, the incentive for that mum to look after her kid. Look, that particular mum we talked to, she had come four hours on a bus to look after her baby, made the wrong choice, spent, a, you know, a, a multiple of the money that she could have spent on safety, and then got on the bus and went back for us. She right. did that because she loved her kid. Why wouldn't she love her kid? So the incentive, I think, the 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 uh, the the reward is already there. The the love that they have for their family, well, they're mm -hmm. no different to you or I. Right. Um, they they love their children just the same. So I think we've already got that as an inbuilt reward that they're doing the right thing. What we haven't done is told them that that is the right thing to do. So, so for the patients, that's a, a, a reasonably easy trigger point. Much more difficult when you're talking commerce because that right. makes people a little bit insane and we start having really irrational decisions. And then you're going up certain levels again if you have that yeah. hierarchy that you sort of yeah. are articulated. all I can hope all I, yeah. all I hope is that you know it, it's an it's a better way of doing business that your company is doing something right mm -hmm. that's becoming very topical at the moment of you know CSR and yes. which, which seems to have that term seems to have gone now and now it's more sort of social um, you know awareness and engineering and stuff mm -hmm. so that's fine that'll do it's all the same same thing just different names but I think that companies that are coming in, especially with a portfolio of products, need to demonstrate that they are um, different from the others, and that's going to set them apart from the run of the mill. So in, in, in most African countries, you've got huge Chinese volumes of imports, and uh, they are cheap. Mm -hmm. But then you've got other imports coming from, you know, the more Western end of the, of the manufacturing mm -hmm. scale. And perhaps they can be shown to have a little bit more empathy and a little bit more connection with the people. I see. And that is going to, you know, sell the other 49 products in their catalog if they, if they look after the, the syringe end. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll do that. And then, and then when it comes to reuse and rag pickers and the kids who, yes. who survive out of this, right. I'm afraid, you know, it's wrong to recycle syringes, they're going to have to find another job. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, for those of us in the audience who'd like to learn more about what you're doing and what I think you're doing is absolutely extraordinary and a gift to millions and millions of people and uh, it's it's a privilege to speak with you. Thank you. How can they find out more information about SafePoint, or I'm sorry, Safe Touch? Uh, Sa SafePoint? Uh, SafePoint um, Trust, yeah. sorry. Uh, so it's, we have a website, safepointtrust.org, mm -hmm. and um, they can go on there and there's a contact sheet they can write, and we'd love to hear from them. And you have a website as well? I have one of my own, which yes. is uh, markcosker.com, and it's M-A-R-C, 
and then koska.com. Excellent, excellent. Nice spelling, as my name is also. Yeah, like uh, I spelled. It's elite. <laughs> Mark, it's been a privilege. Thank you very much for You're your welcome. time today. Thank you. And for our listeners, thanks for joining us. This will conclude this episode of DDP TV with Mark Koska, and hope you'll join us again. Thanks. <laughs>